how we do this, we are the truest, got these fangs super sharp, your shit toothless, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish, in the graveyard, acting foolish, finna dance with the devil to no music, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish. Oh shit, it's a new episode of a podcast called Ghoulish. I am Max Booth, an undead host. On today's episode of the program, I am talking to Nathan Ballingrid about his debut novel, The Strange, which came out back in March. I recorded this episode with Nathan around the same time, but then I thought I lost the audio and I was deeply uh, disgruntled about this. But recently, while digging through some stuff on my computer... I found the recorded tracks, and I am really relieved. I did not want to ask him to come back and do the podcast again, so I just kind of hid in shame that this excellent conversation would never see the light of day. But now it is, because I found it, and I just re-listened to it as I went through editing the podcast, and you know what? The episode rules. We don't often talk about craft on this podcast because that's not what this podcast is but when we do on these uh, infrequent occasions it's always a treat especially when talking to somebody like Nathan who in my opinion is one of the best writers Wilking today and if you haven't read The Strange yet holy crap folks you have to go pick it up it's uh it's, an, it's incredible his collections are great everything he writes is great um, he's talking about the strange on this episode. He's talking a lot about craft, about genre, about film adaptations, all that fun stuff. So please kick back and relax. Well, maybe don't relax. Who am I to tell you how to how to behave? But you, stay tuned. You know, tune in to the episode I recorded with Nathan, and also go buy the strange. But not even but before I end. A little self promo. Is that is that okay? My new book, The Last Haunt, comes out the end of the month through Cemetery Gates Media. It's about a haunted house attraction. I think it's I think it's fun. I don't think it's spooky, but I do think it's fun, and I hope you have a fun time reading it. Also, just came out. Let the Woods Keep Ill Bodies by E.M. Roy. That came out through Ghoulish Books, which is my company. Obviously, you were listening to the Ghoulish podcast. Of course, I would also be connected to Ghoulish Books. Coming out next month, we have St. Grit by Kaylee Schultz. Great novella about a woman who conjures a witch upon self orgasm. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in reading, and why wouldn't it be? Go to ghoulish.lip. That's right. We don't do comms anymore. It's www.ghoulish.lip. Rip. Rip. All right. Let's that's enough self promo. I've I've have exhausted my self promo. Now we are going to talk to Nathan about all types of fun shit. Enjoy. I mean, you and I have never talked uh, voice to voice, but we have exchanged like DMs before. I think the last time you and I did talk, I may have uh, jumped into your DMs in a mad panic back in, (laughs) I think, 2020, because I was on set with my first experience with a, a film adaptation and I was freaking out because they wanted to change the title of my movie and I thought, oh, this is the end of everything. 
That's right. <laughs> and I knew, I knew you had experience with this. And I, I know you you said something that really calmed me down. However, in, at this very moment, I no longer recall what you said. But I'm wondering, mm-hmm. like, what advice would you give an ethical potential a novelist or screenwriter who might be dealing with the, a similar thing? Well, I would say that uh, that whether it's the title or whether it's the content of the story and the way the story plays out, uh, changes are inevitable. Uh, they are they're going to happen because it's you're, you're, the story is being lifted from one medium to another medium, which has its own uh, you know demands in its own uh, structure, and so. I would look at that kind of stuff as, you know, as, uh, you know, as a positive, not a negative, you know, look at these things as opportunities to see uh, the story that you came up with, you know, all alone in your, in your attic or wherever uh, being uh, embraced and retold and reimagined by other people. And it's like a variation on a theme. That's how I think about it. And so uh, to me, I think it's, I think it's fun. I always like seeing the way people change um the stories that I've written uh, to fit another medium doesn't mean I always like the changes, but, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, but I like the process and I like seeing other imaginations at work on it and just kind of seeing it, uh, you know, it's like being taking on a different kind of life. Uh, it's an, it's, you know, it's, it's a rare thing uh, for a writer to get to experience that. And um, I think the only way you're going to be able to do it and stay sane and is to not be precious about it. Uh, you know, the original story is still there, always going to be there. Uh, readers will be able to find it. And this is something different something new. And it's also, it's also, I think a, a show of respect to the other creative people, whether they're the writers and directors or whomever uh, uh, who go, get to in the actors and costume designers, all the people who are bringing their own imaginations to this, it's like you have to allow it to be theirs now. You know, they've they've presumably, you know, given you a check for the right to do it uh, and you cash that check. And so now you uh, you kind of respect their their own their own artistic process and let them do what they're going to do and. Uh, and just see what happens. It's fun. Yeah, I think it could be easy too once you get past like the initial the initial oh my god this is happening stage and you get like into the the nitty gritty of it you can kind of lose track of the fact that this is even actually happening and how great that is so i think it's important to uh remind yourself to be grateful that you even have like an opportunity like this and like so what if something has changed without your permission i mean it still is happening and that that itself is a super cool thing that most people would i mean give anything to, to achieve right Definitely. That's I, I reminded myself of that a lot. And uh, while, you know, while it was happening, uh, I, I was lucky it happened to me twice in two different ways. And uh, and yeah, I kept thinking this is this is kind of extraordinary. This is the kind of thing that I never dreamed would happen. It is happening. Hopefully it'll happen again. But if it doesn't, it did that. It it did before. And uh, and it was a hell of an experience. And it was a lot really exciting. So I know. um the visible filth became wounds and then you had the mm-hmm. TV show as well. Before that, did you have any other experience uh, with uh, film and TV at all? Like did any uh, projects almost happen and then didn't, I mean, I've, I've been through that. So I imagine you probably have something similar that you've gone through. Uh, yeah, there, there have been uh, stories that were options and some of them uh, didn't pan out uh, and, uh, and some are still under option and um and hopefully will pan out and uh when they actually do get translated onto the screen um that's by far the the rare example of uh of what happens when a story gets optioned uh, the vast majority of them majority of them they get optioned and they just never get made and that could be for any of a million reasons um i've heard stories of of uh options that were Came within days of filming, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and then just collapsed right before. I mean, everybody was on site, everybody was ready to go, and then something happened. Uh, you know, a, 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 a financer pulled out, or 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 whatever, and uh, and it all goes away. It all evaporates as if it never was. And um, 
so that you know, the, yeah, the, when things get optioned, it's fun and it's exciting and it's 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 natural to get your you know to get your hopes up and start thinking about what might happen, but just you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it's pretty crazy. Like it's something I've kind of it's, it's dawned on me in the recent yields how often the case is like with those who write and like that's the only job. So mm-hmm. often that's only possible due to like things that will option, but then never made. It's like, like being funded by like these ghosts almost like, oh yes, I was paid for this, but nothing ever will happen. But obviously I still keep the money and that is how I can afford to even write for a living. I think it's something like most readles don't realize like how we get those funded. Be, yeah. Those writers must be doing selling a lot of books too because my options are never even close enough to that i could think about living on them oh yeah yeah Yeah. i mean it's always it's a comp it's a combination (laughs) of many those checks aren't that big (laughs) yeah you you mean you're not getting like a two hundred thousand dollar options nathan shockingly no (laughs) well that's surprising uh uh, what about the uh the strange has that been any any interest with that one yet uh the strange is not yet under any option uh there have been there have been uh some some curious nibbles yeah uh, but nothing has actually happened yet so we'll see i i would be surprised if it didn't get optioned because it's really cinematic in scope and i mean it yeah it takes place on a little planet but i mean it's a desert basically there's many deserts around the u.s i don't think you would have to travel out of the planet to film this but maybe <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope not. I hope it's easier than that. Yeah, I, you know, those those kinds of considerations I never think about when I'm writing because I think that would be just I just think that would be a, a really terrible and reductive way to approach writing a story. But that said, uh, looking looking on it now, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem like there would be any uh, extreme requirements as far as expenditure goes. But then, what do I know? You know, I don't know anything about that side of the business. There might be, you know traps there that i have no idea of yeah i don't know i mean i do i mean the big plus of writing a book compared to like a screenplay is you have an infinite budget when you write a novel and if you do begin thinking that way of like how could a film be made of it you are not going to write a great book i don't think no i don't think so and 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 i think it's what's going to happen there and i think readers will subconsciously pick up on this is that is that you're not writing a book, you're writing a pitch. And uh, and it, the book is going to feel like it's a pitch. You know, it's yeah. going to feel like it's, it's not a finished thing. It's 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 trying to be a different thing. And that's not fair to the to the reader or to the uh, to the to the book itself, to the project, to the story. Quick side note, going back to name changes, I feel like I'm having some type of a Man- Mandela effect going on here. <laughs> Your second collection is called Wounds. At one point, was it called the Atlas of Hell? Yeah, that was the that was a title that I that I uh, that I pitched it under, and um, the title was changed, uh, you know, to to kind of piggyback off of uh, off of the movie. Okay, I've I've read the collection, but even so, I in my head I was still thinking it was called the Atlas of Hell until I uh, was uh, gathering some notes before jumping on, and I was really confused. I thought maybe I had just imagined this. Yeah, no, that was, and I still think of it as being is. I still think of that as a title. Uh, the the, uh, the title uh, wounds. I understand why the choice was made, and I signed off on that choice, and just like mm-hmm. you know everyone else it was it seemed like the the right call um but uh but it doesn't really it describes that one story the visible filth mm-hmm. but it doesn't really describe the rest of it whereas the atlas of hell is more descriptive of of the entire journey uh, you take through that throughout that book yeah i it's a great title and i'm sure you've had many well, i would hope you've had some meetings about potential uh, adaptations with that collection because to me that would be like just an incredible television show. You have such a great premise with that collection. I appreciate that. Thanks. There's definitely the, the, that's one where there are a couple of things that are under option, uh, and uh, and I have some hopes for those, and uh, and I definitely have some more just of my own ideas uh, around around that that yeah. whole idea of hell uh, to to flesh out still. 
It's funny. I'm usually not a podcast who just m- tries talking about film adaptations the whole time, but <laughs> for some reason, I, just, I think just because we've had this conversation in the past, that's immediately where my brain goes to when I talk to you now. But I'm um, talking about the books themselves. I have to say, you f- from a real standpoint, Every eve, this is book three now, novel one. But yeah. every book you put out seems to be pretty different in scope. Is that something that you will intentionally like trying to do to always bra- broaden what you will writing, or is it just your interests seem to uh, go various directions? Because, I mean, for those who don't know, the strange is it's really different from the previous two collections in a way that I love. It's. I wouldn't say it's really that much in the the whole genre. In fact, I saw a few tweets from you the other day of you saying it's a joke fantasy, which I would agree with. And you will surprise that p- some fans will calling it science fiction. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so to your original question, it's not the, the 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 different like flavor of each book isn't something that's necessarily planned out beforehand. It's just that these are the stories that kind of come up. Um, like, you know, I'm casting around for ideas and here's an idea that grabs me and it happens to be very different from before. Uh, well, you know, when Wounds was coming out, when I was writing those stories, when I was in the middle of some of the pulpier stories in that in that collection, I was really kind of uh, anxiety written about it uh, because North American Lake Monsters was doing, was doing well and it was being very well received critically. And... And I knew that the smart thing to do uh, uh, would be to capitalize on that by by doing that again or telling those kinds of stories again. But uh, they just weren't there. You know, when I sat down at the keyboard to write, those weren't the stories that were there anymore. I was kind of tired of being in that headspace. And I was just wanted to do something different to have a little more fun. So those the the wound, the Hatless of Hell stories, the ones that started coming up. And I had a great time with those. And then when it was time, when I was thinking about the novel and, and and working on that, this story about this girl on Mars was there. And uh, and so I, and her voice, it's a first person narration, which is uh, something I hadn't done much of up until that point. And uh, her voice was just compelling to me. It was just like sitting down and listening to her talk. I didn't really have to, it didn't feel like I was doing a lot of the, of the work. It felt like I was just listening for a lot of that. Uh, process. So yeah, it's not intentional. And at first I was worried about it, but then I just decided that uh, it was useless to worry because this is just how it's going to be. And, um, and yeah. uh, you know, and I like writers who do that. I like writers who are different, uh, who give me something new each time out. I, I, could, I could sit down and not know precisely what I'm going to get. All that said, though, I do feel like they're uh, all of a piece. You know, I feel like I feel like they're all the same, coming from the same sort of, uh, you know, the same cauldron. Uh, you know, the the stories in Lake Monsters are very different from The Strange, but um, but they don't feel different, you know, on a granular on your on a more basic f- foundational level to me. Um, and uh, and you mentioned genre, so science fiction and horror. Uh, yeah, when I said I was surprised that they were calling it science fiction, the strange, I probably shouldn't have used the word surprise because I'm not really surprised. I get it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's got robots and spaceships. It's on Mars. It's got all the, you know, it's got the trappings of science fiction. Um, it's just, it's just not at all based in any kind of science. I mean, this Mars has a breathable atmosphere. Uh, there's farming on it. There's a baseball team on it. Uh, it's uh it's 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 not real Mars at all. Even Bradbury had a more realistic Mars than 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 I'm I'm using here. So I don't think of it as science fiction because of that. You know, all the all the the heart of it comes from dark fantasy, and I think uh, and I think dark fantasy is probably the best way to describe all of what I do, um, even more than horror. Even though some of the stories clearly lean more in that in in that direction, I think, but. The one umbrella that might encompass everything is dark fantasy. And I think they're all kind of come out of that garden. Do you think much about genre when you are writing something? Or is that something you can settle once you finish? Like I know some writers, they 
they think about it ahead of time and they think, okay, now I want to write, say, a science fiction book. Well, now, now I'm going to do my um, my my dark fantasy book. But Evels, they just kind of write whatever interests them. Like I'm thinking of Joe Lansdale. He doesn't really seem to uh, prescribe to any one genre. He just writes the Joe Lansdale genre. And I get similar yeah. vibes from you, which is why I'm such a big fan. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, and I'm definitely more of, of that of that that approach, the Lansdale approach. Uh, I used to think about it when I was early earlier on in the game, and when I was uh, newer at the whole thing. And whenever I did, it would trip me up. I would, it would freeze me up. I would stress about it. I would. Uh, it just became a real problem, um, and so I just had to let that go and uh, and stop worrying if the stories are so different. To stop worrying, is it a science fiction or is it fantasy or is it a western or whatever? It's like just just write this thing, write the story. Yeah, um, you know, and the the stories. And since I made that call, um, it's just been easier. And even now, I'm like I, I've, I'm writing a story now which is like highly you know pulp fiction influenced. And when I say that, I mean in the sense of uh, the stories and wounds, which have a lot of over the top, you know, kind of uh, you know circumstances, strange settings, uh, things like that. And I'm also writing stories that are much more grounded and much more, uh, you know, uh, based in the world as we understand it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, those 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 things that once felt like contradictions to, to me no longer do. Now they just feel like, you know, they're all coming out of the same same garden. Yeah, um, I also I also think like when you do try to intentionally, not you specifically, but anyone, when you mm -hmm. try to write like a specific genre and you have that in mind ahead of time, I think you could trip yourself up by thinking, okay, what are the rules of this genre and how do I follow them? And then that's how you write something uh, predictable and something you've already read before. So I think not having that in mind, it's probably like the best way to write something worthwhile. I agree hundred percent. And I think that's why it's, you see so often, and I see this mostly in like, uh, in horror, especially in horror, horror films is where it's most obvious to me, um, is when you see people getting trapped by the rules of the genre where the first, uh, the first half of the first two acts of the film seem fresh and exciting. And then they've got to wrap things up. And so all of a sudden everything starts falling into place and you, it's, the third act tends to fall into the sort of, predictable beats where all the same, you know, you know, what's going to happen next, you know, how this is going to resolve and all the excitement, the strangeness in the life that kind of sucked you into the story. The beginning uh, gets reduced into formula by the end. And yeah, uh, yeah. If, I, if I could go the rest of my life without seeing the um, wrapped in a blanket by an ambulance ending, that would be great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned uh, a little bit ago that, all these books, everything you write, they seem to come from the same uh, cauldron. Now, in my head, this seems like it's going to be a good question, but it's really possible I'm going to ask <laughs> it. And you're going to go, what the fuck does that mean? But I'm going to ask it. What to you are the ingredients found in this cauldron? Oh, interesting. Well, I think I have always been and continue to be fascinated by uh, morally compromised characters. I'm completely bored by... Uh, heroic protagonists. Uh, I'm bored by morality plays. Um, you know, I'm I'm bored by fiction that seems didactic in any way, like it's trying to instruct me uh, on how to live or how to think. I just uh, it doesn't engage me. It doesn't feel real to me. It doesn't feel like the world that I live in or the people that I know. Um, the world that I live in feels uh, complicated. It feels contradictory. It feels, uh, you know, it's a place where I can hold opposing truths in my head at the same time, and uh, it's and it somehow makes sense of it, uh, and uh, and it's a place uh, where I think good people find themselves justifying uh, bad things, you know, to put it in a very simplistic sort of way, and um, and I'm fascinated by the process of that. I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by how how people turn down these strange dark paths um, but still have this kind of core self-identity as a good person. And um, 
And so I find myself returning to that kind of theme a lot. Um, I'm fascinated by, uh, you know, darkness, uh, the trappings of, of, of the horror genre or, 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 or a Gothic literature, uh, those kinds of things. They're just, they're, I can't get away from them. You know, that's just how my heart is cast. I think of these things. I think of all these stories weirdly as, you know, and privately as nighttime stories. To me, that's how I really think of everything that I write. They're all infused somehow by, by the aesthetic of night, whether it's evening and late night or midnight or what have you, they're all, they all come from there. And, um, and so when you ask what the ingredients, those are the main ones that I think. Um, yeah. No, we don't have uh, we don't have cameras going right now. But if we did, you would see me grinning and uh, nodding along because I, <laughs> everything you're saying is like, yes, please. And this might sound disgusting, but I would love to just drown myself in this cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we mentioned a few genres and especially dark fantasy, but something this new book of yours has that we haven't talked about you know, lots of Western elements, I would say. I mean, I I don't think it's a stretch to say this was probably inspired by True Grit. Oh, yeah. No, not at all. I, I, try, I try to be very upfront about that. Um, it has a lot of uh, Charles Portis in it. It has uh, some Paulette Giles and Molly Gloss and Larry McMurtry. I love Westerns, you know, and uh, – and uh, I just love the aesthetic. I love the feel. I love the the language. Um, and um, and it was yeah. writing the second book, Wounds, where I just finally became comfortable. Just like, just throw in everything that you love into these stories. If you love it, put it in there. Find a way to use it. And uh, and I had read, of course, True Grit uh, years ago. And it stuck in my mind. And uh as it does for so many people. And uh, I was reading uh, News of the World by Paulette Giles early on in the process of this too. And it was just, um, I don't know, it was just a, a place I really loved to be in my head. Um, and especially uh, with those two books where the, again, we get back to that moral ambiguity. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to play in that sandbox basically. Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say true grit is missing is, the robot sidekick so i'm glad you were able to uh, fix that one issue that book has <laughs> <laughs> i love i mean i'm a i'm a sucker for any type of movie or book that involves like a kid traveling a great distance on an eventual like say the talisman and i'm all i always love when they get this little sidekick with them like and say the talisman he has uh the, the wolf guy um right so but this yeah. so for those who haven't read the book yet not to get too deep into it but the main character she has a robot who is a dishwasher because she, her and her dad they uh they look at is it the only restaurant on the planet uh it's not the only one but it's just it's it's a it's a diner in this in the colony that they're in yeah I guess it would help if you maybe briefly introduce the book to the audience, what the the the, the main prem premise is and who this protagonist is, because I'm just randomly saying things out of context that it's not <laughs> going to make any sense. Okay, so The Strange is a, kind of like a coming-of-age story. It takes place on Mars in 1931. The premise is that about a year before the story begins, all communication with Earth has stopped. Um, they call this the silence. They don't know why. It's just stopped. And all, you know, the shipping of goods and services, the shipping of people, all of that has stopped. And so whoever was there is stuck there. And they're faced with this idea of not knowing what happened to their home and not getting any more support from home. And so they're really kind of, worried about their future. Uh, a lot of them are grieving, including uh, our protagonist, uh, Annabelle Crisp, whose mother went home for a visit and is can never come back now. And she doesn't know what happened to her mom. And her dad is uh, also bereft uh, and, and sinking into a kind of a, a deeper depression about this. And uh, so one night they run a diner together. The the parents did, and Annabelle helps out. Uh, the diner is in the first chapter. The diner is robbed, 
and uh, they take several things. They assault her father, uh, knock him unconscious. And one of the things they take, they take these little cylinders, these little metallic cylinders, which is what they use to give personalities, quote unquote, personalities to their to their robots. And uh, on one of these cylinders was the last recorded message that her mother left for her and her dad before she went back to Earth for her trip. And uh, it's taken on a kind of talismanic, you know, relevance to her and her dad. And uh, and so after it becomes clear to her that the people in the town are, so the, the people who robbed them are kind of live out in the desert. They're referred to as, as these desert cultists. There's this kind of mysterious aspect to them. No one really knows what they are and lots of rumors surround them. And when it becomes clear to her that the people in town are are too frightened or too meek or or what, whatever, pragmatic to go out and hunt them down she decides she's going to do it herself one of the things she takes her she takes her uh the robot assistant which is his function is to wash dishes uh with her and she kind of uh she sort of uh blackmails <laughs> another person and then uh, yeah someone else to go to go with her and so there ends up being four people going out with uh all together and they have Kind of complicated relationships, and uh, and the idea behind this is Annabelle starts out. She's a big fan of Pulp Fiction. She reads uh, the you know the dime novels, Arthur Conan Doyle. She's got a very simple idea of right and wrong. Uh, it's very black and white, and uh, and she's very driven. And that notion gets deeply complicated uh and turned around on her and the idea of what a good person is and what a hero is and all that stuff get you know they get turned upside down uh on her on her uh on her excursion i think that's a great way to pitch the book um would it be, be okay to awkward. would it be okay to talk a bit about joe or would that be too spoiling no i yeah we can talk about joe I find his whole Kittlesville and like his place in town so hilt breaking. Could you uh, kind of give the audience like some context of who he is and why everybody hates him? Yeah, Joe Riley is uh, he's kind of lives in exile in the outskirts of town. He is the only person. So there's a ship that can go back to Earth. There's one ship that was parked here. Uh, and it's got about enough fuel to make one one journey back to Earth. And there's a lot of debate in town about whether or not they should. Uh, and he's the only person here who can pilot the ship. He was uh, he was just a guy running a route, you know, when the silence happened, and he found himself trapped here. And he's too afraid to do it. He's too afraid to go back. He's afraid of going back to a place that is empty and devoid of life uh, and being stuck there because there wouldn't be enough fuel to get back home. And... Uh, and so he won't. And uh, so he kind of he's kind of lives in exile in the outskirts of town, uh, hated by most people in town because of what he won't do. And uh, it's just sort of living in this uh, alcoholic fugue. Yeah. Of, of, I, you know, artists and self-loathing. I love his heel tool. He did such a great job with him because like. You can re like as the riddle, you can definitely understand why the town would have such bad feelings against him. But also, you can definitely understand Joe's point of view with why he doesn't want to waste it. Because what if it's a death trip? Yeah, he thinks it might be a death trip. He, it, I mean, that's the thing is he doesn't know. He might go back to a, you know, a thriving community and be welcomed, you know, or at least have a have a life to go to. But what if it isn't? What if it's just a wasteland? He doesn't know, and he's 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 too scared to take the risk, and so he's living in this uh, in this kind of limbo of being too frightened to take the next step. Yeah, with my own um, writing, something I find I struggle with a lot is developing like a, a whole new universe and the rules and like basically what makes fantasy good fantasy. And I th think with everything you write you do such a great job. I mean, from like the, the skull pocket novelette to anything you write of developing like this whole new reality that I, like I could never even conceive of. So I'm just curious, like, like say with the strange, how is that brainstorming process like with you? Like when you write something or you 
setting aside a document of just like, okay, what is this universe? And like, are you setting the rules down or how, does it just come to you as you write? It seems so complicated to conceive of. It, well, th- thanks, uh, first of all. And mostly it just comes, I don't set out a document. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, organized about it at all. Uh, usually I will just, usually it just comes organically with the narrative. And I privilege the narrative over the rules. Um, and so in general, at first anyway, and usually at about halfway through, I'll get to a point where I'm like, okay, I've got all these weird things going on. Um, I can't go any further until I figure out how they interrelate with each other and how they make sense. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult. And sometimes I'll have to go back and change things in order to make it make some kind of sense. Um and sometimes not. Sometimes it fits together quite naturally. Um, that was the case with Skull Pocket. Skull Pocket just, you know, it would just all kind of grew organically and it and it it, it, uh, it kind of fit with the, with itself. Um, yeah, and, and the thing the thing that I find that I that I have to do, especially when I say I privilege narrative over rules, is that there comes a point where you realize this thing is kind of uh, kind of bonkers in some ways like you know this is the case with uh, uh the butcher's table too it was like all right this is this is a, absurd you know <laughs> um, and it's a gut check moment because it's like when you step out of it okay back into the real world and you gotta buy groceries and you gotta you gotta you know pay the bills and you go and you look back at that thing on your desk and you're like it's just ridiculous <laughs> how can I go back into this seriously? And it, it 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 almost falls apart. You know, it's like a house of cards that starts to shake, and uh, and you just have to make a commitment, or at least I do in these moments. We're like, all right, I'm going to buy into this. I'm going to take it seriously. You get back into there, and as absurd as it all is, is 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 ridiculous as it all might seem from the outside. On the inside, you have to treat it uh, as if it is just as real as the world that you're paying the light bill in. Uh, you have to take it just as seriously, and uh, it's like a question of belief. It's an act of it's an act of faith in the in the thing, and um, and with each of those stories in which there is that kind of world building, there has been that moment where I've just got to say, all right, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, there's they can farm on the moon. There's bugs out here, uh, or Mars rather. Uh, yes, yes, they can. So am I going to explain it? No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, uh, it it doesn't matter why or how. It's just it just is. You know, there's another. The reason I said moon. There's a novella I I sold recently. I can't say where to yet. Called Crypt of the Moon Spider, in which there are forests on the moon, um, and spiders live in those forests, big ones. And it's like, does it make sense? Obviously not. Am I going to worry about that? No. It's just how it is. It's it's part of the buy-in. It's part of the suspension of disbelief that I'm asking of a reader. And if you're going to ask that of a reader, then you have to ask it of your. You have to perform it yourself. You have to be that confident when you write that it does make sense within the confines of this story. Uh, and you never blink, and you never question it in the confines of that story. And if you don't do that, then hopefully you give the reader a solid enough foundation that they won't have to do it either. Wow, that's. I mean, just amazing advice for anyone who's writing. Just so, just thank you for that. I mean, I, I think anyone listening who's in, interested in writing, they need to really like take that and consider what you just said because taking what you were writing seriously is like one of the the best pieces of advice you can have. Because I mean, I well, so many books and movies, well, the premise is a bit bizarre and strange. And the moment you stop taking that seriously and kind of embrace mm-hmm. it with a like ironic tone, like, oh, isn't this so oh, silly? Yep. Yeah, completely. But if you now lean that into that, week, um, those are, it do, some nods. it's like just wrecks it. Mm hmm. There's an author I love called, uh, named um, Carlton Malik III. He writes mainly in the bizarro genre. Mm-hmm. But what I think separates his books from so many other uh, bizarro uh, labeled books is he can have the most, str- he can have the strangest concepts, 
he always treats it seriously. Like he has a book called uh, "Every Time We Meet at the the Daily Green." My my head fucking explodes. I believe is the title, and the <laughs> the, the whole premise is. Every time this person um, gets like in a romantic uh, situation, she uh, her head explodes and it regrows. But it's treated so seriously and just profound. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And yeah. what you're saying it, it definitely applies. I just it makes me excited to go to end this podcast soon and go and do some writing on my own, <laughs> which is like the the best compliment I think I can give anyone. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch upon before we wrap this up is basically writing a novel because I feel like you you developed a pretty strong fan base coming out with two incredible collections. And I don't know what you've written that hasn't been published, but I just wanted to know, like, what was it like for you to now come out with a novel? Like, did you have other novels that just didn't come out before then? to do these two incredible collections. I mean, I forget when the Neil the Milligan Lake Monsters came out. I feel like it was maybe a decade ago. Is that right? Almost exactly. It's 2013. Okay, great. So, I mean, yeah. for, so for a decade to pass and now to come out with a novel after you, this collection has gained like this, what I, what I view as a cult following. I mean, what was that like? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it was like. It was it was just it, I didn't think about it, you know, in a that much in a sort of like in the way that you're you're that you're talking about it. It was just uh, it's more that um, well, to answer one of your questions, no, there isn't an unwritten novel that, or a written novel that's not published. This is the first one that I've ever written. Wow! And uh, it's more like the ideas that I started having uh, were changing. Uh, they did, they wanted more time. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. You can see it. You know, the stories in Wounds tend to be longer than the stories in Lake Monsters. And, uh, and then there, I started writing novellas, and it was just I I became less interested in what I could do with a short story, which is to hit in a kind of emotional note um, or a moment, or it's like okay, I'm going to hit this, or, or or you know, epiphany stories, those kinds mm-hmm. of things. Um, I I felt like I felt like I had done it and now I was trying to do I'm trying to do new things and the kinds of things that I'm more interested in doing now require spending a lot of time with a character um spending like, like getting in their skin and living th- with them through various experiences and seeing how that changes and seeing how their choices drive them. That's kind of, maybe that's more what it is. I'm interested in consequences. I'm interested in actions and consequences and long-term consequences. And in order to do that in the way that I'm thinking about them, you know, I need more, uh, I need more room. And so it's not, it wasn't a choice like, okay, now I'm going to write novels. It was more just this idea is novel length. And so is this idea. Uh, These aren't short story ideas anymore. Yeah. And I still love them, but not, not nearly as often. Like I've got some, short stories that I've published since wounds came out, but not enough to make a, a third collection yet. Um, and it may be some time before there are. When you, this wasn't a question I was thinking of asking you until right now, but when you do, a, when you, you've done two collections now, and I feel like both of them, they, yes, they all come from the same cauldron, but each collection, maybe each, the stories in each one come from the same, uh, a uh, uh, punch bowl maybe uh, do you have in mind like okay my next collection is going to cover these types of topics and themes and so going filled when i write stories i want to kind of touch upon those to make a cohesive collection is that something you think about at all usually about halfway through uh, at first no at first i'll just be writing the next stories and then uh I say halfway through as if that's a defined a dis- distinct moment. It's not. It's like usually I'll get like three or four stories done and I'll notice a kind of thematic connection that they might share. And then I'll say, okay, this seems to be the thing that I'm thinking about now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the next stories, I might be more conscious in uh, in pursuing that sort of thing. Um, like with Lake Monsters, there was no thought about that at all, at all especially in the beginning. 
And like towards the end, the, the last story I wrote in that book was The Good Husband, um, which also ends the book. And that was the only one that I wrote thinking that I want it to be a, cap, a capstone for the collection. Um, and then the wound story started coming out, and I wrote a few of those before I thought at all about, about uh, what the identity of the book would be. Uh, the Diabolus came without thinking about that. The Atlas of Hell came without thinking about it. Visible filth came that way. And then I was like, all right, these stories have some th things in common. Um, let me think about that. And then things like Wounds and Butcher's Table and Skull Pocket came out of that. And uh, and so with the next grouping, it may be too early to say that, but I seem to be, there seem to be stories about, uh, you know, ghosts crop up a couple times, uh, witches have cropped up a couple times. So it's like, all right, maybe I don't know. I don't know what that's going to mean, but but yeah, but the closer I get to having enough to put another book together, I'll be thinking more objectively about about what the theme might be and how to and how to tie it up. I do have to say the phrase "a uh, ghost crop" is really intriguing. <laughs> it's a crop. Well, of I ghosts. have a literal ghost crop actually in one of the stories <laughs> called Three Mothers Mountain. This uh, this witch grows ghosts in her garden. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible <laughs> did you say that was already out that shield really yeah that's in uh that's in the ellen datlow anthology screams from the dark okay three mother's mountain that sounds amazing i will have to look into that one um <laughs> okay i mean you have a, a moon uh spital novella coming out in the future you can't talk about the strange is out yeah. now i mean when the episode goes live, it will be out. If it's not already out now, I know the book comes out in March at some point. Uh, what's it's, the twenty first is the date? Uh, okay, I know some people who have pre ordered it are starting to get theirs already, so it's probably it's already trickling out into the world. The book is great. I loved it. I've never read anything by you I disliked, and you, Thank you, Max. everything I read is somehow really different but also like you say from a the same cauldron that i'm going to drown myself in one day <laughs> it's a fun eventual the kill tools all so great and engaging and i think anyone who picks this up is gonna love it um fans of you of yields will not be <laughs> let down and just thank you for doing this podcast and thank you for writing such a fun book that's very kind of you to say thank you thank you for having me on this has been uh this has been a lot of fun and, and and thank you for thank you for the support. And that was Nathan Ballingrid talking about his new book, The Strange. Go pick it up any place you can buy books. You can even get it at my bookshop, Ghoulish Books in Selma, Texas. If you want to buy it from us online, go to ghoulish.lip. I think we have a few copies left in stock. Come make us not be in stock. We like being out of stock and stuff. It's cool. It's fun. It's sexy, some might even say. My new book, The Last Haunt, comes out end of the month. You can get a signed copy at that same website, www.ghoulish.oip. Rate and review the podcast on iTunes. If that's something you like to do, if it's something you hate to do, don't do it. It's not that big of a deal. All right. See you next week. I'll be talking to E.M. Roy, I believe. Yeah, an episode with E.M. Roy about small towns. Until then, live spooky, die spooky. Rest in peace, Max!